Hello, Automating uh, Success followers. This I'm your host, Joe Langton. Today, I'm really excited. I have Logan Fahey with Robin Autopilot uh, on the show. Just to give a quick introduction, if you don't know who Logan is, and Logan will do a much better job explaining himself than I will, but this is a guest that I can actually give a quick uh, bullet point presentation. Um, I always say good competition is great to have. I do believe uh, Logan and his team at Robin Autopilot are uh, a group of those good people that we're working uh, with to build an industry together. Um, they have uh, their whole goal, and Logan, you can go into this, but in my, from my perspective, to try to blend uh, uh, some API and make it so everything can be seamless in one app to make it easier for the end professional user and to basically make the path of uh, less resistance to get people involved in the robotic uh, automated space. But without further ado, I'm going to let Logan tell me if I if I got that quick bullet point right. This is going to be a great show today. There's a lot to talk about uh, with Logan Fahey. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me, Joe. Um, I, I think we, we go back um, probably five years now when we first got into the space. And um, yeah, it, it's an interesting an interesting story in that we we started um, in the long garden space um, in 2012. And um, uh, we're based originally in Cleveland, Ohio, had a channel on a garden stores and landscaping companies and saw the need for automation in the sector. And so we got involved, um, what were originally, um, Robin technologies based in the DFW market. Um, and long story short, made a couple acquisitions, um, of Robin and eventually Mobot and have really overhauled the way we do business and who we focus on, um, all being industry focused. And so, uh, today we're we're headquartered in in Dallas, Texas, and focus on working with mid market and above landscapers, municipalities, universities, um, and parks and rec, and uh, a lot of crossover between what uh, Automated Outdoor Solutions is doing and what Robin's doing. So excited to talk about the industry as a whole and and how we all uh, how we all move the needle. Yeah, no, I mean I I say all the time, Logan, that you know we're building an industry, and when I say we're you know companies like AOS, companies like Rob and, uh, you know, and then, and then the people in your group, the people from Mobot that you brought under the Robin, uh, the Robin portfolio, I'll say, you know, everybody, whether, you know, you're just getting started or you've been in it for a while, we're building something that didn't exist a decade ago in this country, you know, so it's pretty exciting stuff, right? Um, so one of the things that I always think is interesting, and maybe we can start here is kind of the story to me of, uh, of how you got started. And, and by the way, as, as I say this, we'll go farther back to, to some of your other things that, that, you know, were landscaping supply related, but didn't you start out as just a Robin autopilot franchisee that then you kind of took over the whole setup? Is that, that the way it went? That's right. So Robin launched in 2017. Um, they had their own robot as a service business in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex had some early success and actually got on Shark Tank. And when they got the opportunity to get on Shark Tank, they said, hey, huge opportunity to try to blow this up throughout the US. And so um, they got on their first Shark Tank show, I think it was end of 2017 um, with Richard Branson and Mark Cuban and the crew. And they got some really great press from it and ultimately decided to franchise it. And so we were uh, Robin's third franchise. We were already operating a robot as a service business. But Robin had built some unique things, a patented robotic door, um, some unique software, they had a cool brand, and they had a great partnership at the time with um, MTD, who happened to be uh, MTD, now owned by Stanley Black & Decker, Cub Cadet, the, the whole SKU, um, happened to be in our backyard and literally their headquarters was next to our lawn and garden store. And so I said, well, this is really unique. Robin's a little bit ahead of its time, and so let's partner with them. So we bought... Um, third franchise, and then ran that for a while and ultimately bought out the network. Yeah, so um, that, I mean, if you don't mind me asking, what what kind of made them kind of, I mean, did they see a different level of leadership or uh, in, in letting you take it over or what was their reason for giving it up so early? Yeah, so they grew fast um, and probably too fast. Um, just being, you know, honest, it uh, 
it, you know, they did 18 franchises in 12 states um, fairly quickly. And with that comes a ton of capital. The other thing, and you know this all very well from this industry, is it is a really difficult business to get off the ground. It requires a lot of capital um, and customer adoption. You're building a completely new sector. And so they grew too fast, um, which, you know, is good and bad. Um, and we were able to come in and put the capital up to really strengthen the network of franchises. Um, we invested heavily in the groups that had the infrastructure, had the, you know, the, the, the ability to actually scale up these businesses. And what we found during the process was the businesses that were successful at doing this were in the industry. So partnering with existing lawn care companies, existing landscaping companies, existing irrigation companies who had infrastructure, who knew how to sell to customers ready, and then bolt on robotics as a solution to what they're doing. This isn't a McDonald's franchise where you pop open a building and, and the people will come. And that was tough. And so there was, there was and, and this is very true for Mobot as well, which was very similar to Robin in that it really is a business that needs to be bolted on to existing green industry companies. And it's not a standalone venture at this point, as the industry grows, it might be. And so we invested a lot of money to clean that up. My business partner, Morris Baker, who um, started in the outdoor um, uh, sports equipment and um, RVs and um, um, boats and so forth, had a lot of experience in scaling up those businesses. So him and I partnered um, and really strengthened the network. Yeah, I, I think you said a couple of things that were uh, quite interesting and they hit close to home for me is, A, it's not the type of thing where you put a building in and people are going to flood the doors because they still need to be convinced, right? They it, and, and one of the things that I'm sure you run into this is, um, you know, it, it, out east in, in the European markets, labor costs are much higher than they are in the United States. So right now you still have to overcome the, why would I want a robot when I can do it for the same price with people, you know? And and that's where you can tie into what you guys have done. And one of the things that's that, that I was able to do is I just converted my book of business at first from LinkedIn and, and you guys are partnering with other, uh, you know, people in that industry. But you were, you, you have a start it kind of in the industry anyways, you know, when we met in person and you saw my, my landscaping yard and you, you, you honestly, you said something that surprised me because I didn't realize it. Maybe a lot of listeners don't know. You were like, Oh, this kind of reminds me of our yard and our supply. So tell, tell, tell the audience a little bit about that. You know, before you got into this franchise, uh, well, when you started as a franchisee and now, you, you know, you are Robin autopilot. Uh, what did you do before that? Yeah, so um, like so many of us, I started mowing lawns um, in high school. Um, I, I went to a, a great school in, in Cleveland called St. Ed's, and um, the, the agreement was is if I was going to go to the school, I had to pay the last two years, so junior and senior year. And, uh, and so I did it by mowing lawns, and, uh, and it turned into a real business. And I actually, um, I joked that I almost uh, flunked out of school because I was so focused on running the business and skipping class at the end of the day. Um, but I loved it. And so that, that first business, business was Lennox Grounds Management, um, which I sold in 2012 and loved, loved the, the landscaping space. Um, and so I went on and actually worked for a nonprofit that was looking to build a large scale landscaping company that would hire um, those coming out of incarceration, uh, mostly youth. And so it was a social enterprise. So I built another landscaping company. It's still around today called True North Landscaping stayed in the space. And um, if you fast forward, um, we created Fake Group as really an opportunity to acquire companies that were distressed and focus on really revitalizing them. And one of those projects was Landmark Lawn and Garden Supply, uh, which in, in the beginning had three locations servicing most of um, the west side of Cleveland, um, wholesaler to large scale landscapers. Um, the business had been around for 85 years, um, an aging owner. And so I had the opportunity to take that over, which would have been uh, 2016 into 2017. And, um, and that really was my first forte into really working with landscapers in, in, a, in a professional setting and, and providing for them. And number one thing we kept hearing was labor shortages, labor shortages. And so that's when we ended up becoming an actual Husqvarna dealership in our stores. 
And so we started selling traditional Husqvarna product um, and we're able to figure out, okay, does robotics fit? And then ultimately we end up launching an actual operating robot as a service business, uh, which is called today Landmark Automation. And ultimately Landmark Automation became the Robin Autopilot franchise. Um, but that business taught me a ton about the industry. You know, outside of running a landscaping company, you take an 85 year old business that's been working with companies that have been around since their inception, started as a feed store, progressed into a chemical wholesale supplier, bulk materials, and, um, and we still own the, the flagship location in Avon, Ohio. And uh, I, I think we were joking when we were in Chicago, my, my favorite thing to do when I'm back is to sit in uh, our Caterpillar loaders and, uh, and load trucks for a couple hours, it just clears your mind. So um, it's very cool to still have something that's focused on the traditional side of the business and then also have the innovative side. Yeah, no, I, and it, so I, I have to tell, um you know, the audience is that it's amazing is, you know, you, we see people in the industry and just think that's what that person does. But when you came out to visit me and I started to learn that, I was like, wow, we're actually more similar than I realized, you know, until until we met. And And that's one of the things that I'm really enjoying about the industry right now is, you know, I think sometimes everybody gets started at first and for me, at least, uh, you know, maybe this was my own personality flaw, but you know, you, you sometimes you get nervous, like, okay, I don't want people to know what I'm doing and this and that. But, but what you realize is it's going to take such a large group of us to advocate for this industry together. Um, you know, put, put things we already have in our past. I mean, ultimately what I've realized by seeing you is you could be very successful doing all the other things you're doing without being involved in this automation space, but but you're passionate about the space and you believe in the space. And and I feel the exact same way. You know, it's like, I, I believe so much in what this will do for the professionals. You know, I just need to me to get the professionals to see it. And, and I feel like we kind of share the same mission. Um, do you want to maybe kind of add to that? Yeah, no, I think that's right. Um, I mean, certainly, the the uh, the traditional landscaping companies and lawn and garden suppliers um we uh, you know have always been profitable good ventures right and they produce good income we've had a solid customer base for a long time but at some point we said listen the industry's changing and we watched this happen in manufacturing and healthcare and we're either going to be ahead of it or we're going to be left behind and so you know, we took an early faith. I mean, it, you know, we were originally dealing with MCD products, um, which was early into the business with friendly robotics, uh, Robomo. Um, we've worked with, you know, Steel and Works and all these different players who have really come to the market early. And I'm happy we we got in where we did because we've learned so much. And as I've talked to large scale Landscaping companies are just now saying, okay, I'm ready to deploy robotics. It's like, okay, here's the 20 things you need to be thinking about. Because if you don't have the infrastructure, if you don't, if you don't map out your properties correctly, if you don't spend, if you don't know your capital commitment to this, you're going to flunk. And that's the reality is, is this is a, a difficult business. It's a rewarding one if you do it right. But it's taken us um, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to figure out how do you do this right? And then how do you help others uh, get across the finish line? Yeah, no, I think that's well said. And, and that's very true. And even when you bring up the bring up the mapping, um, you know, one of the things that I've always said, and I still fall into the trap, and I don't uh, tell me if you want to elaborate on this, but when we call them robotic lawnmowers, I think that's half of the issue, right? Manufacturers want to do it all the time. Oh, look at this robotic lawnmower. And people have seen too many episodes of Terminator where, there, where Terminator <laughs> fixes himself, right? Uh, so I always like to say, you know, it's like a dishwasher. If you load the dish upside down, it doesn't wash, right? It, you know, it, you have to like load the robot properly. You have to get it out there. You have to map it right. You have to install it right. And you have to actually look and say, okay, yes, there's a hole that this thing might get stuck. And you have to find a customer that's willing to fix those things, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but that's the biggest thing for me. I want to call it a frustration. It's it's something that I have to like feel like I have to over educate on the fact that you know the, a human being will just mow around that. The robot is going to fall in it every day. You know? No, that's absolutely right. And we we've got the same philosophy, and it's taken a while to get the educational components correct. And you learn as you grow, and there's lots of 
Um, lots of companies who have went at this the wrong way, and it it uh, you know it frankly um, screws screws the system for others because the reputation uh, reputational risk of doing it wrong up front then spreads throughout the industry. And so there's been a lot of the last five years of fixing people's perception of the technology and understanding you know robotic technology might do 80% of that property. And that's a win, right? But yes. to push it to do 100% and to have it on islands in a supermarket, you know, might not be the right fit. And let's, let's be honest with customers and let's get it right up front so that the industry as a whole can accept that it works for these use cases and some of these other use cases, new technology will start to fill over time. Well, absolutely. I mean, Logan, you said you like to sit on the cat loader and, and load trucks to clear your mind, but you use a different type of loading machine based on what you're trying to load. I mean, there's skid steers and front end loaders and every industry has a different tool to do a certain job. And that's that's the one thing that I always kind of kind of find laughable when people are like, well, when the robot can do everything, you know, they if, when the robot can do edging, I'll buy the robot. And it's like, but you have an edger in your in your trailer right now. It, it, you're you're using a different tool anyway so but I, I think right now that's the excuses people use that maybe don't have the capital or don't have the ability to buy the equipment so then they try to use they try to come up with every excuse possible to say why they're not going to use it right um so you know something i i want to talk about before we kind of move past it so the the, the nonprofit that you worked in um or that you got started Tell me a little more about that. That interests me. Um, I think that was an amazing thing that that you guys did. Um, and you said it still is actually in operation. So that's a venture that's still going. T talk, talk, talk to me a little about that. Yeah, so we got involved in an organization, um, or I got involved in an organization very early on in my career um, called True North Ministry, which is um, focused on working with youth coming out of incarceration on work readiness skills, um, actually helping uh, post-release on how do you get a job, how do you keep it, how, how do you become a, a successful member of the community. And I really spent um, the, the first part of my career with True North building a landscaping company, which is obviously in line with what we do today. That work expanded over time. Um, I spent time working for the Dalton Foundation, which is part of uh, Part Source, the largest medical parts provider in the world. Um, and then with a organization called um, uh, Towards Employment. And as part of Towards Employment, we actually built a chain of retail bakeries, um, which uh, were in the heart of, of downtown Cleveland. And as of the end of 2019, we actually, uh, Fay Group bought out those bakeries um, and have continued to do the wholesale side of that business, focused on hiring those coming out of incarceration, doing a real task, um, getting them life skills, and then moving them on to partner companies. And so I've, I've kept a, a, a part of me focused on, can we still make impact? Social enterprises is, is a real way to do that successfully. Um, and even at Robin, we have an open hiring model, right? We're, you know, we don't discriminate based on people's past. Um, I've been a big proponent of that. Um, we will hopefully become a, a benefit corporation um, in 23. Um, which just really focuses on being transparent around your financials and your company and your culture and your, your pay. And um, I think that's important. I think we're, we've got a mission beyond environment um, and we can do a lot more. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I love those days. I wish I could have stayed in the nonprofit sector. It's such a, a cool space. Um, but the reality is, is impact is driven by scale. And it was very difficult to scale those ventures under um, the nonprofit capital structure, which doesn't allow in, you know, for-profit investors and VCs and all that. And so you're really limited in your ability to scale those. So I've stayed involved. I'm on the board of the Social Enterprise Alliance. A um, lot of cool things going on there. And I think landscaping companies um, could really benefit in general from deploying more workforce development strategies, building pipelines of the right um, individuals to work. And I'll tell you, we had, we had huge success um, working with those coming out of incarceration. I'm really glad I asked you to expand on that because I think that's a great story. I'm I'm glad that people could learn about that because, um, yeah, I mean, you know, this is this is an, an industry that's constantly needing 
people, right? And constantly need replacement. Even if we're going to do automation and robotics, it's going to take people to do that. And there's always going to be people needed in this in this industry as as we keep building buildings and and adding green space. It's needed. So I I think it's really cool that you did that, uh, not only to give back to the community, but to also build your pipeline. So I applaud you for that. Um, all right, so let's talk about uh, how you got and how you kind of took over the MOBOT relationships. How, you know, how, tell me the, the, ch the challenges up front, how you had to convert the mindset um, of, of those people, because I'm sure to them, they were like, well, I, you know, I set up with MOBOT. Now I'm not MOBOT. You know, how, how did you guys work through that? Because I think you did a pretty good job of it uh, from my perspective. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> Having gone through the conversion of, of Robin uh, groups and the conversion of MOBOT groups, um, I'm, I'm finally turning gray. Um, and it is it is a challenge, right? I mean, I'm, I'm always really transparent about these things. The the reality was, is there was two um, strong entrepreneurs running Robin and Mobot before we took over who were pioneers in trying to disrupt the market, right? Um, and it so often it happens that people move too fast and, you know, the, the technology wasn't all there um, across manufacturers and this wasn't a standalone business. And so we worked really hard. And my sole goal as we did both of these transactions was how do we make people whole who this might not be the right business for? And then how do we focus the brand and the, the operational um, skill set that everyone had built on the right people? So uh, we have great Mobot and Robin groups still operating throughout the country. And we have groups that weren't the right fit for the platform long term that we were able to successfully get out. And the, there's you know complexities in, in all of that, but I'm proud to say that we were able to do it without any any sort of legal battles or um, issues and, and clean up both networks. And those that wanted to stay, we've supported, we've put them in a cost structure that's not franchise driven. I am not, um, you know, love everyone who does franchises out there. Um, I'm not a fan of, of the franchise model. I think it it really in a in an already difficult business, it it sucks a lot of cash off the top line, and I think it makes it very difficult up front to build um, a successful franchise when you're also disrupting an industry. Franchises are great when you get to the point of you're a Chick Fil A and the 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 business model is well oiled and you just get in there and you crank it. This is this is for disruptors. This is for people who want to really change an industry. And so with with Mobot in particular, Mobot had a great brand. They had good consumer relationships and they had a great relationship with Husqvarna. So when we made the acquisition of Mobot, uh, we also became strategic partners with Husqvarna. And um, obviously, as you know, and you work with Husqvarna, there uh, have been and continue to be the, the, the leader in robotics here in the US and um, in Europe. And uh, so we strengthened that relationship and we're able to offer um, a really unique package for Mobot uh, groups to become part of the Robin family and still utilize that brand. So today, Mobot is really the, the forward-facing brand that groups will use to market in a particular environment. So I always use the example of Mobot of the Triangle and Raleigh, um, you know, has a really well-run Mobot franchise that has been just killing it. They've done a, an incredible job with City of Durham. Um, they've done an incredible job partnering with companies like SuperSod and others that, um, and they've, they've built that network correctly. And so the goal is to continue to grow Mobot as a operating system, but we don't do uh, franchising in either Robin or Mobot. Uh, I, that's perfect how you kind of put that and kind of cleared that up for people. Um... And, and I do agree with you. I mean, it, it's hard to get the franchise model going right now because it's going to constantly, the technology is going to constantly adapt. So how do you get a perfect playbook um, for someone? It's it's not like making a sandwich at Subway where it's like, yeah, th this many pieces of meat with that many pieces of bacon and that's what you get because tomorrow there'll be a new player that's out and people are going to question and wonder what they should do with that. So, so I, I do agree right now. I think it's, it's way too early on. And some days I question whether or not it'll ever be able to be a model in the landscaping space because, you know, landscape professionals, you know, they're hesitant because they've seen their margins get pulled away as time has gone on, you know, 
the consumer doesn't want to spend more money to mow their their uh, their lawns or green spaces, um, but the equipment's more money, the fuel's more money, and labor's more money. So they watch profits slip. So the only benefit for them is to get into the automation space and start to profit again. But then if somebody's trying to skim franchise fees off the top, then they're basically feeling like that should be their piece. So um, I, I like that you brought that up because it makes me know I'm not the only guy that thinks that, right? It's, <laughs> you're right. I mean, but we're in the industry, so we understand it or have been in the industry. So, so now knowing that, you know, you still have to make yourself whole at Robin Autopilot. So explain to people what Robin is doing. You, you, just, you said you're not a franchise. Um, so, so explain what the core mission for Robin Autopilot is. Yeah, so we have, we have two sides of the business. Um, we have a technology side of the business that's focused on building fleet management that's multi-manufacturer. And as part of that, we, we've launched our new puck system, which attaches to um, handheld equipment, non-connected, zero turn, so forth. And then we have um, the fleet uh, system that's connected through APIs direct to the manufacturer. And the, the goal of that system is landscapers are going to be multi-manufacturers. Some may do a Southwest model and, and be one manufacturer, but the, re the reality is, is you end up needing to mix manufacturers because you might have uh, one property that's a fit for a Sierra by Husqvarna, another fit that's a, you know, a TM2000 by Echo, another system that's a work, you know, it's all over the place. And so how do you make that one system. And then in addition to that, our, our puck system was built in a way that it operates off of one central hub on a truck and each puck communicates with that hub as it exits the truck and enters the truck. And what that's allowed us to do is decrease the cost of being able to track your equipment, but then also know the activity tracking components. How long is a piece of equipment running on a particular piece of property? Um, and so that's the tech side of the business. Um, the other side of the business is what we refer to as our marketplace. And so you pay a subscription fee. I hate to use this example, but it's very similar to, you know, your Costco model of you, you pay a membership fee to be part of basically a buyer's club. And we work with uh, most manufacturers to be able to offer um, a sub dealer model to our clients. Um, so a client comes to Robin, they pay a monthly fee they get access to our operating guides, our marketing hub and other resources, but then they also get wholesale pricing, um, fleet pricing on manufacturer's product. And then we tie that all in with, with different financing. So we, Robin now offers our own subscription program. So you can subscribe to robotic units without having to put it on your balance sheet. Um, you can finance it through our partners. Um, and so we've done a lot of that to try to simplify, okay, how do we get um, this product into, you know, landscapers' hands at all different levels. Um, and then the last component I'll mention is we've got a big California initiative um, that's focused on helping landscapers transition to electric. Um, and that includes everything from handheld equipment all the way through robotics. And so uh, what we're doing there is we're actually um, acquiring um, gas power dealerships um, that might be aging out or not want to be in the, the market when everything goes electric and trying to build central hubs of, of electric powered dealerships. Um, we also have a mobile dealership um, that's going to start moving throughout the country that's focused on educating landscapers on landscapers, corporate campuses, governance, and so forth um, on electric and robotics. And so that's our offering. Um, and so we're really a subscription-based model um, as low as $99 a month up to $1,500 a month, depending on the scope of work, the type of products, and then if you're using uh, our product or just buying product. Awesome. So how many people do uh, you have in your network now? Or, or, you know, I mean, I know it's going to range size wise, but um, or if you want, if you want to give the exact number, how many states do you have people in uh, currently right now? Yeah, so state wise, I believe we're in about 15 to 20 states. Um, a number of uh, mid-market landscaping companies were about 50 active in the U.S. Um, we've got a couple outside the U.S. who use Robin software and not our uh, product. Um, and then we have enterprise level customers. So, um, you know, a, a Davy Tree or an A&M University, a City of Durham, DFW Airport, um, those would be enterprise level customers. And those are really 
uh, more complex relationships where it's a lot of consulting and then helping build the plan. Um, actually, I'm, I'm sitting in Dallas as we speak. Dallas just um, announced a, a, a proposal that's going to city council to ban gas powered equipment in Dallas by 2027. Um, so we're working with a lot of groups in central DFW on, okay, how are we gonna do this? What's the right way to do it? And by the way, we're not for bans. Um, we are a huge proponent of let's do this sustainably. Let's make sure there's infrastructure. Let's make sure there's education. Let's make sure there's rebates and incentives. Um, but uh, there's been obviously California has led the, the movement and now it's going to push through uh, places like Illinois and New York and DC um, and, and even Dallas. And, you know, people think Texas is um, against green, um, not in the, not in the core not in the core cities. And, and so we're, we're very focused on those initiatives as well. Yeah. It, so I was going to ask what you thought. So you took that right, that, that question right off the list, but the, um, I agree with you. Like, here's the thing that I never understand in the bands. They, they, they want to ban the sales of it, but they don't keep this. How are they keeping it from coming in from the outside? <laughs> uh, you know, I, they're not going to do anything to shore that up. So really the only thing they're hurting are the, the dealers that sell the gas equipment, which are also people that collect sales tax for these states. So I, I you know, I never understand that kind of the short sightedness of these quick, like knee jerk, this is what we're going to do. Because if they did work with the professionals to say, Hey, when, when do you need gas? Um, and this is one of the nice things about working with Dan with AGSA, you know, is is he's a huge advocate for this to say, hey, you know, if you've got an eight month operation and you can use electric five of the eight months, that's a huge carbon reduction. That's great for the industry. That's five months of less noise. But, but you know, the thing about what they would have to do is they would have to figure out a way to educate every property manager that expects a leaf free property, every homeowner that expects these great cleanups at a certain price because they ban it and then it's just more time. So yeah, I mean, we could have a whole nother show talking about this. As, as you can see, I'm still uh, an active, I'm president of a landscaping company. So yeah, when I hear those bans, I'm thinking, you know, it's almost impossible, but we'll see what happens. Um, so, you know, one of the questions I always get since I'm kind of in multiple businesses, you know, how do you manage your time? Because you're a busy guy, you're, you're in a lot of businesses, you're traveling a lot of places. Um, and I know how I do it. I have a great team of people. And I'm assuming that's the exact same thing you do. So do you want to kind of talk about that? You know, how, how have you built this great team of people that allows you to be Logan? Yeah, no, it, it, it's definitely our team. Um, it, uh, it's, it's funny, we have, um, I believe we have six people who have been with me since um, our first venture, which was the uh, Social Enterprise Bakeries. Um, so that goes back uh, eight, nine years now. Um, and so I've been able to carry forward a team that's been part of a couple different ventures and um, that's been super helpful. Um, we, we have a great um, uh, leadership team in, in Ohio who runs those businesses and I'm able to get back once a quarter, but it's still tough, right? I mean, the, the challenge with Robin was, uh, you know, how do you build out a world-class tech team? You know, it took me a long time to get the right CTO in place. Um, and it's taken a long time to get the right sales team in place. Um, and so, and, and building this through COVID was, you know, no easy task. Um, especially on the labor side as everything went remote. And, um, but yeah, we have an incredible team. My uh, chief of staff, um, Ellen, has been with me from the very beginning. Um, we've, we've got a, a great head of sales, head of engineering. And, um, and so we're, we're continuing to build, but we still struggle like any other company um, on the software engineering front. Um, we've had to build a decent amount of offshore teams. Um, and then, you know, travel, uh, you know, all these companies are all over the country. And so I spend about 200 days a year on the road and um, it's worth it because I get to spend the time with the companies and hear firsthand, this is what's working, this is what's not, and let's troubleshoot, let's figure out what's going on. So um, it's fun. My uh, my family probably uh, would, would like me to do less travel, but <laughs> maybe in a couple of years. <laughs> that's what I keep saying five years I'll, I'll be slowing down but I, I I doubt you or I either of us are going to slow down in two or five years the you know and you're right about the travel because it's important because there's just certain things you can't see on a satellite right you, you need to get out there you need to see that turf type you need to see 
how their operation functions. Um, because at the end of the day, people like us, we're kind of like architects of robotics, right? I mean, that's, that's or automation. I see, I called it a robot, Logan. I need to stop doing that. But, mm -hmm. but we're architects of automation. Um, you know, you need to see the spaces, you need to see the slopes. Um, th these are all things that factor in uh, to, to how we can help our, our clientele or partners, you know? So, you know, there was something else when I was doing the research, um, I saw that there's a, a company that you're also a consulting project. It's the REDF uh, in eSearch. Um, what, what, what are those? I was a little interested in, in seeing that. Yeah, so um, REDF is a organization out of California that um, I've worked with on a couple consulting projects around social impact, social enterprise. Um, they're doing really incredible work on the social enterprise side. Unfortunately, um, over the last uh, two years, I've not had uh, the time or ability to do, to do many new projects, um, but I've stayed involved. Um, I joined the Social Enterprise Alliance Board, which is based out of Nashville, um, about a year ago now and, and, and lead their governance committee. And that's kind of kept me in the social enterprise sector. And then eSearch is, is interesting. It's actually a, um, it's a recruiting firm um, that's been around for probably 50 years at this point. Um, I met the gentleman on a board I served on in, in Ohio, uh, Randy Samsel, and uh, we've been able to build some unique technology about talent recruitment. Um, and so when I was, was first starting Fay Group, we created a software platform that helped companies evaluate their tech talent and get uh, consistent anonymous feedback from employees around what's working, what's not working, are there issues in the workplace we should be um, you know, taking a look at. And, um, and so I've stayed involved in that, um, uh, eSearch Talent Solutions and uh, Workplace Next. Um, but today I am... It, it feels like I'm 90% uh, Robin Mobot um, and, and some of these other ventures, um, members from our team have been able to get a little bit more heavily involved in. Awesome. Yeah, speaking of uh, Robin Mobot, um, you know, some things that I've, you were very nice to let me uh, try and see your uh, cable finder and your uh your your uh, dog door. Well, it's not really a dog door, it's a robot door. But um <laughs> So, you know, these are other things that, you know, I, I think I, I think this goes back to like building an industry, you know, and kind of seeing what the industry needs. Um, so I want to give you an opportunity to explain uh, first how your 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 cable break uh, finder works and what makes it different than somebody saying, I'm just going to use the same system I use for an irrigation repair. Right. Um, so we'll start with that. Uh, so to kind of tell us what inspired you to make that. Yeah, so one of the number one, I mean, as, as everyone um, hopefully knows, a lot of the robotic mowers are still wired. Um, and one of the number one things we were hearing from clients was um, breaks in the wire are one of the biggest barriers to doing robotics. The amount of uh, technicians going out and fixing wire breaks is just too many. Um, and so we would send people out with these um, wire brake finders, um, you know, where you put your headphones in, you listen for the tone, tone drops off. Um, and our, our head of uh, hardware um, said, well, there's got to be a simpler solution. And so, um, and I'm, I'm not the right person to talk engineering, but I'll give you a high level. Um, it, it's very simple in that tap into the wire and basically you're narrowing down um, where the break is. And so it's initially going to tell you the breaks to the right, to the left, and you're just going to narrow it down over time. It also is, is really powerful. So, you know, we typically say 10 minutes to find a break with the wire break finder in a normal property. And what's, what's also very powerful about it is, is that it can find partial breaks. And that was originally what a lot of the patents were around because um, if a squirrel's eating at a line and it only does a partial break, which is very common or an edger just takes a partial break, um, the wire break finders in the market, a lot of times will have difficulty finding a partial break because you could still get a signal um, from that line, but the mower might not have a large enough signal. And so it's a simple technology at its core, but it was meant to be super simple in that any technician should be able to go out and find a break within 10 minutes. Um, I've used it myself. I used to use, um, oh, the, uh, uh, the, the, I can't think of the name it off the top of my head, but the, the readers where you, you, you'd see and you'd run a wire all the way back to the base station and, 
Um, then you'd split the yard in half and you'd keep doing this over. And this basically simplifies the process for that. Um, and we also work with it in the irrigation space, um, invisible dog fence space. Um, so it's a kind of a product that meets multiple needs at the moment. Yeah, and I'll I'll kind of elaborate to the people listening that don't understand the difference in, in what Logan was saying. So when you think about the cable brake finders that existed before, um, what Logan and his team came up with, you you put a different you put a separate frequency on the wire. So the robotic lawn mowers use a very small amount of current. You could cut the wire, you won't even feel anything. But the cable finders, you can dial it up or down, and you can put the a higher voltage or lower voltage. And what I found, Logan, with my technicians, uh, I think it's human nature. They hook onto it and they want to put the signal up as high as it can go, right? So they they boom they put a signal. I mean, you could probably get 600 volts through a single strand of wire very easily, you know. So um, and not saying that the cable finder has 600 volts, but it has a high voltage, right? So they would say high voltage every place, and I would always have to educate them. You got to bring it down to the lowest signal possible to actually hear it, you know. But in scaling a, a automation company, that's a hard thing to do. So, so you know, to teach every person, they have to do that. So, yeah, I, I think what you did was great because it, it does keep them from ripping up wire. You know, the, the hardest thing in this industry is to try to job cost um, the things that the technicians don't realize add up quickly. You know, a half a spool of wire could cost 150 bucks, you know. Uh, so, so, yeah, by being able to do that and diagnose and figure it out. I, I think that was a great ad you guys gave to the industry um, a solution. So, you know, good job with that. And then and then the uh, the robot door, uh, you know, explain how that works um, and how you guys get that marketed out to people that need it. Yeah, so this was a unique thing in that we were we were found in Texas and Texas, um, you know, the, the saying is, is the, the greatest neighbor is a fence. Um, and so everyone in Texas has, um, 10 foot high fences. And so the biggest barrier for putting in robotics was how to get the mower from the front to backyard. Um, otherwise you need two. And so back in 2016, 2017, our um, head of hardware engineering developed the first robotic door. Um, and we we developed the first version. It's evolved a lot. Um, we hold four patents around it. Um, but the idea is, is that the mower can unlock the door, move, uh, you know, through the, through the fence into the backyard and vice versa. Um, it works with all brands at the moment. Um, so with the exception of the larger units, we've not made a door big enough yet for a for an echo, but um, it works with with all of your um, consumer grade robotics and smaller commercial, and um, it's really filled a unique a unique need. Um, we have started licensing the door, um, and so we have one active um, licensing agreement with one of the large manufacturers that'll be um, working with the technology in the market um, in 2023. And the intention is to continue to do that. I mean, we we built the technology; we're not a manufacturer. Um, and our intention is that the technology be made available, um, hopefully to all manufacturers who have a robotic mower and need this solution. Um, and so we continue. But at the moment, we do manufacture, we do sell it. Um, uh, manufacturing is not my favorite business to be in, but we we do it out of necessity. And a lot of these things have been out of necessity. You know, we weren't in the business of making, you know, wire brake finders. Um, but the reality was, is if our clients are saying this is a hurdle, how do we help the industry overcome those hurdles so we can move robotic mowers, right? And the more robotic mowers we move, the more need there is for fleet software. Um, so there's a lot of components to that, but um, certainly um, if you're in need of a robotic door, um, check us out. Awesome. Awesome. So we've reached this point in the podcast where I like to stop talking about business and just find out a little bit more about Logan and kind of find out a little about your background, family, you know, t tell me a little bit about, about uh, the, the younger Logan and your upbringing. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. So I grew up in Cleveland, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, um, in the, uh, in the industrial district. And um, we, uh, you know, we had a very humble family. Um, my mother was a bartender. My father's a painter. Um, in fact, my father's in town in, in Dallas um, for Christmas and he can't help himself but um, painting my house because he says I did a terrible job. So um, it, uh, so awesome. great, yeah, great parents. <laughs> um, I, uh, I was able to uh, put myself through uh, St. Ed's, which is a private school in, in, in Ohio. And 
um, got my start um, doing lawn care and, and, and working in the uh, criminal justice system for a while. Um, but it's been great. Um, I recently got married um, to my husband, Luke, in uh, May of, of, of this year, actually. Um, and so we, uh, we celebrated that and in the middle of the pandemic, we're able to work through um, all, all the, the challenges that are, uh, are there. But we have a great family um, here in Dallas and uh, spent a lot of time between Dallas, Cleveland, and because of our California operations, we've been spending a lot of time there. So, um, yeah, blessed to be where I'm at today. For sure. Congratulations on the marriage, by the way. Thank you. Um, so, so, uh, what what is your, your uh, what does your husband do? Is yeah, he any so, part of your businesses, or you know, so Luke does. Um, he's a uh, land use and government relations attorney. Um, and uh, does a lot of work in Texas, but uh, he actually has helped Robin quite a bit on a lot of the new regulation that's being passed in California. Um, and so we work with a lobbying firm, DCLRS, um, that works with NALP and some of these other organizations. And we've been working quite a bit, uh, and he's been doing that pro bono for us. Um, and then uh, he's also helped quite a bit on our economic development incentive packages that we've negotiated with the cities where we have um, office locations. And so it's fun to get to work together a little bit. Um, and actually, our offices are walking distance to each other here in downtown Dallas. Um, and so we'll have lunch every once in a while. But, you know, I always say that the healthiest thing to a marriage is um, uh, my 200 days of, of travel a year. So, <laughs> so see, this is what happens. I, I'm not married yet, but I, I always uh, say that Gretchen and I, we work it out pretty well. And when I, when I do travel, absence does make the heart grow fonder. That, that is for <laughs> sure, you know? So it allows me to be who I am and not get, and, and not drive her crazy because my mind never shuts off, you know? So, so it's good. So, okay. So then, um, do you have any brothers or sisters or anything or? Just... No, only child, um, which, you know, everyone says, oh, you must have wanted to have a brother or sister. And I keep saying, no, it's been, it's been great. But uh, Luke's family is, is huge. And they're all based here in Dallas. Um, so I, I now have a, a sister and brother-in-law and they're all having kids. So we've got, we've got lots of kids around and nephews and nieces now. Um, and so that's really exciting. Um, and it, uh, it will eventually adopt and build a family. Um, I keep saying when, when my life settles down, but um, it sounds like we'll be, we'll be doing it regardless. Yeah. I was going to say, don't, don't wait for your life to settle down. It'll never happen. <laughs> I mean, I, I had my daughter, you know, I was really young and I'm glad, I mean, it, it's, she's part of the business and yeah. uh you always find time, you know, it doesn't make a difference. You, you always find time. So yeah, you should do it as soon as you can. Um, so do you have any mentors then in your life? I mean, who inspired you to be so entrepreneurial, you know? Yeah, it's a great question. So I got a really big break when I was um, coming out of high school, a guy named Ray Dalton, who was the founder of Part Source, um, I mentioned earlier is a massive medical parts provider um, in the US. Um, and he was the founder and CEO. And, and we met at a volunteer event and he saw something in me and uh, gave me an opportunity to, to work in the family foundation and then in the company's VC very early on. And so I kind of propelled my career and he was a mentor through there. But um, uh, a board member of Fagu, Brandy Samsel, um, who I've, I've been involved with for the last uh, almost 10 years, um, has been an incredible mentor and uh, continues uh, to mentor me. And then I'll also say Robin has a unbelievable board. Um, I, I always joke that I've, I've got a lot of bosses, but um, we, we have a really great board of directors, um, a lot of which come from the industry. Um, Lisa Fiore from Landscape Hub and Joe Paul from Davey Tree and Jonathan Potoshnik from Service Autopilot. And so they've given me tremendous industry knowledge and mentored me throughout the green industry, which um, it's a big industry, a lot of players, a lot of politics. Um, and so it's really, it's really been helpful as someone who's been in the industry, but not in the industry as, as someone offering product um, to get that mentorship um, up front. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and it is, it is a huge industry, um, but it, it's a very rewarding industry. You know, there's a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of great people in our industry. Um, you, you're talking about your board that I think are like fly under the radar entrepreneurs and business owners. You know, there's we there's so much to manage in our industry that I don't think our industry gets enough credit for the type of 
of like leader it takes. You know what I mean? Like, so car industry, for instance, you, you take an inventory, you push it out the door, um, groceries, store chain, stuff like that. But with us, it's like we're dealing with, and not us, I mean, the landscaping industry, environmental uh, issues, leaf, you know, noise bans. There's all so many things that I just think nobody gets enough credit for. So that's great. It sounds like you have a great team or board that you set up around yourself. Uh, so that's good. Good job, Logan. Um, so background education then, I mean, you, you, we, we know you almost had issues uh, at St. Ed's because you were too <laughs> focused on cutting grass, but uh, we know, what'd you do? What'd you do after that? What, what'd you go to school for? Yeah, so I went to school for, um, I think, less than a semester, um, went to a private uh, university called Baldwin Wallace in uh, Cleveland and dropped out um, to go work for Ray Dalton at PartSource. Um, and uh, I've never went back. I, uh, I, I, I kept telling myself in those first couple of years, I'm like, oh, I'm, I will definitely be back. I'll do this next venture. And uh, now I can tell you I'll never be back. Um, you know, I, 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 can't, I have this dream when... Um, when, when I have kids and uh, they go to college, maybe I'll go with them for four years and um, do that in my uh, kind of retirement days, but um, it's, uh, it's not coming anytime soon. Yeah, so uh, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but we kind of have that in common. I went to uh, small circuitry analysis, uh, two years of that, but nothing to do with business, nothing to do with the things you and I are doing. I, I think that uh, it's, it's, for me, it's my passion. That, that leads me into what I do. And I, I think since you've had your uh, hands in so many things, I, I bet it's very similar, you know? And now I feel like if I did anything, and it's it's always funny to me because I wonder if they would allow me to be a teacher, you know, but one day I could see myself wanting to like teach at a university. And I just wonder if they would discredit me as a teacher because I don't have a degree, but uh, uh, th that's the only way I could see myself being in any university, you know, so. <laughs> that's great so yeah. so i mean I, I don't know if you feel the same way but you know I yeah, lost you know, like, at some i keep i keep saying one day i hope i can get an honorary degree and then um just just have it on paper <laughs> I, I don't know if those exist but maybe i should look for that same yeah. <laughs> when so you a i think they exist <laughs> yeah so the um you know, have, have you ever experienced any business failures then, you know, at, like, you, you know, and things that maybe, I mean, I know for me personally, I've had struggles in my business, but I would never give up those struggles because it was my business education. You know, do you have anything, uh, would, would you agree? Has that happened to you? Yeah, I mean, certainly we've had, um, we've had plenty of ventures that we thought were great ideas that, um don't pan out. I mean, you know, investing, um, you know, frankly, investing in a bakery right before the pandemic um, and buying those out, you know, that, <laughs> that, you know, obviously we didn't know the pandemic was coming, but, uh, you know, that was, that was a challenge and, you know, it was hard to keep those businesses alive and continue to pay employees. And, um, and we've had, you know, just, just growing up, there was many times where I said, oh, this is the next business. I remember a company called the Penny Pincher, which was a, uh, a magazine that, um, you know, sold ads and you deliver to people's houses. And I thought, oh, this is a genius. Well, you know, it was a dud. Um, and, you know, it failed miserably. And, um, and I'm, you know, there's, there's plenty of those, those uh, cases, but also, you know, I didn't come from a family um, with with any heavy resources. Um, you know, my, as I mentioned, my my father was a painter, my mother was a bartender, and um, had a good upbringing, but um, didn't have anything to fall back on. And so, as as ventures failed, um, and I'll I'll tell you the probably most prevalent one is I had this this grand idea that I was going to run for city council in Cleveland, in kind of the heart of downtown Cleveland and the the surrounding suburbs. And I got my ass kicked, um, which was, you know, it was a humbling experience, but it was a rough experience, right? You campaign for almost a year um, and you raise a lot of money and you're, you're door knocking nonstop. And, uh, and frankly, it, uh, you know, the candidates wanted, or the candidates, the residents wanted um, someone who was pro neighborhoods, pro uh, residents. And I was very pro business focused on the economic development side. And uh, so I got I got slammed and, you know, uh, great experience at the time. I didn't think it was a great experience. But um, so, yeah, all those failures, I think, make a big impact in how you think. 
Um, I'm just happy I got the political blog, bug out of me uh, early enough um, because you couldn't pay me um, to get involved in politics today. Um, but yeah, no, all those experiences um, ultimately build who we are. And I think if, you, if I didn't have any failures, I think it would be very difficult to deal with the companies we deal with and the people and really understand what they went through and what it takes to actually build a business from scratch and know what it's like to not be able to, to make payroll, know what it's like to have you know, your lights being threatened to be turned off. All those things are what makes you hopefully a good leader. And I still have you know, a, a shit ton to learn, um, but it, uh, those experiences certainly helped. Well, Logan, the best leaders are learning every day. So, you know, we we all know we've got to constantly learn to evolve and keep pushing forward. So uh, so that's good. I mean, it's good you're humble and you realize that I, I feel the exact same way. And going to the politics thing, A, I applaud you for trying to do what you did. I, uh, I helped one of my friends run also. And watching that, I, I literally watched how it, you know, you start with a vision and then people start, trying to change that vision. And I said, personally, for me, I could never do it. I'm, I'm too socially moderate. You know, it's like, I, I'm the type of guy that, you know, totally, if people want, you do whatever you want to do, whatever makes people happy. But I am a conservative guy fiscally. But in this country now, not to get too, too off onto this, but your 50% of people are going to dislike you. And I'm just not somebody that I can let 50% of people not like me. I want everybody to like me. So I really don't understand how politicians can do it because I just want to be liked, you know, and, and I want to make everybody happy. It's not even about being liked. It's about trying to make every human being that I talk to in the end happy in some way. So I just know there I could never do politics. So good for you for trying. Yeah, <laughs> so, good experience. Yeah. So. So do you have any big future plans then for what you're doing at Robin? I mean, it sounds like you definitely have your vision and your mission, you know, um, you kind of said it. So anything new in the works that you can talk about yet, or it's business as usual, you're just going to get those uh, high end, mid, mid and higher market landscapers in, in the portfolio. Yeah, you know, in in twenty three, we're we're heavily focused on uh, not only mid market landscapers, but we're working with a lot of universities and municipalities. Um, so, you know, right now we're we're working with you know DFW Airport and City of McKinney, um, which are we're here in the Metroplex, we're working with City of Durham, um, and I think we'll continue to expand that work quite a bit. Um, I'm excited about um, the university partnerships that we've been working with. Um, and then, of course, you know, landscapers, our goal is to continually double um, year over year the number of companies um, coming on board that we're working with. Um, in terms of product, you know, we're, we're pushing out more and more um, updates on fleet. So the goal, um, I believe today we have four manufacturers fully um, uh, on fleet, which includes, um, you know, Husqvarna, um, Ambrosio, um, hopefully Echo will be soon. Um, they're, uh, they're, they're starting to get lots of um, great units on the ground. Um, and then we're working with Nexmo, uh, which is a drop and go system that's on the platform. Um, and so the goal would be to get another, um, two to four manufacturers, um, fully loaded on the platform. And that's very dependent on what our customers are using. So, um, we look closely at, you know, if, if a landscaper is going to start to use, um, you know, 10 greensies in the field. Well, then it's important to us to make sure that greensy is, is integrated with our system. We spend a lot of time on that. And then on the other side of the system is we integrate with the uh, industry ERP system. So uh, your Aspire, Service Autopilot, Boss, um, Element, so forth, um, making sure that the systems our landscapers are using are also integrating with our core software. And so those are really our priorities. Um, our puck system, we're very excited to launch. Um, we're launching with 12 companies all under a pilot program, um, monitoring everything from chainsaws to edgers, trimmers, blowers, mowers. Um, and so that'll be a fun uh, quarter one project. But uh, a lot on the a lot on the horizon. And I also I'm I'm pretty excited about uh, the California work. I think um, you know launching a first our first all electric dealership in California. Um, in the heart of San Jose. Um, it's going to be a fun fun project and give us a good presence and helping those landscapers qualify for um, the core program subsidies is going to be uh, it's going to be critical. Fantastic. So 
in the end then, because I mean, obviously there's gonna be a lot of change in this industry. So what do you want like your personal legacy in, in, in this industry? And then actually in your life, but you can maybe say industry life, or if it all ties in up to you, how you, how you close yeah. it out. You know, I think, I think they're, they're very similar in that I, I'm a big proponent that, you know, the industry's got to change. And ultimately, I, I really do believe that um, energy sustainability is, is going to be critical long term. And so to the extent that we can really help this industry do it in a sustainable way and in a way that actually helps their businesses and see landscapers flourish without putting people out of business and moving too fast and pushing regulation down people's throats, I think we can we can end this, you know, if you fast forward 10 years, I think you'll see most landscapers with all electric, all that vehicles setups, you'll see the infrastructure, you'll see robotics uh, being impacted in a big way. And I'm also a huge proponent of increased wages. So I think um, as robotics gains attention, as technology continues to progress in the green industry, I love seeing us be able to hire 30, $40 an hour employees compared to $20 an hour employees um, who can do this robotics work, who can be great technicians and, and, and get certification programs and so forth. That I'd love to see because I, I was part of the industry when we were still paying $10 an hour um, and it wasn't a livable wage and it's a tough, tough job. And I'm a real proponent of, of this model of higher paying jobs that are more technically skilled that are fixing uh, a, a real problem in the industry. Um, and I hope my personal legacy is, is, is being part of the overall solution along with the core team, which um, and of course includes you and um, the you know, a small group of us who have been focused on this now for um, years. And uh, I hope that group continues to grow. I always say, one day, I hope that there's 20 competitors um, to what we're doing, because that means that the industry is growing. Um, so I, I am excited about where we're going. Yep, fantastic. I think that's a great closeout. I think uh, that's per it's, uh, it's, it's inspiring to see that there's other people uh, in the industry that have the same vision on wages, and the future of our industry, people being appreciated for the hard work they put in uh, to keep our outdoor spaces looking as beautiful as they do in this country. Um, so with that, Logan, I really appreciate you being on, on Automating Success. I think this was a fantastic episode and uh, hopefully this builds our on our relationship and we can do this uh, again, maybe in a year and we can kind of have a recap on, on where things are going. So, yeah. Thanks for having me on and uh, look forward to seeing you in person at some of the upcoming conferences. Awesome.